Welcome to California Now, a podcast produced by Visit California. I'm Soterius Johnson. Today, we're going to go on a surfing safari of sorts. We'll talk to Izzy Tahani, a surf instructor who specializes in helping first-timers pop up and ride. Everyone wants to catch a wave, ride it in as long as possible, and everyone will always remember your first wave. It's like your first kiss. You'll never forget it. Then you'll meet Ryan Robinson, an adventure athlete who recently embarked on an epic Northern California road trip. So the sun's setting, and we have the sounds, and the feeling of the sand on our feet, all of the senses were peaking. It's just such a cool thing. Plus, we'll talk to Ruben Martinez from glampinghub.com. He shares some of his favorite glamping destinations in the Golden State, and he even has a special $50 savings offer for podcast listeners. It's all coming up on California Now. Welcome to California Now, a podcast produced by Visit California. Our goal is to introduce you to some of the fascinating people and places that make the Golden State such an irresistible place to visit. The Beach Boys said it best, catch a wave and you're sitting on top of the world. And I'm willing to bet that my next guest agrees wholeheartedly with that sentiment. Izzy Tahani is a former pro surfer and the co-owner of Surf Diva, an iconic surf boutique and surf school located just steps from the beach in La Jolla. Last year, surfing was recognized as California's official state sport, and September 20th became California's Surfing Day. So we're going to talk to Izzy about surf culture and surf lessons. Welcome to the California Now podcast, Izzy. Thank you. Aloha, Satirius. Aloha to you. Well, you know, it became official last year, Izzy. Surfing is the official sport of California, and there's even a California Surfing Day to celebrate each year. What do you think of that? I think it's fantastic. This is something that we've been working towards for a long time in terms of getting surfing to have more legitimacy, more recognition. And to us as surfers, we can't think of a better sport to represent California. What What is it about this sport, though, that, that you think generates such passion? The thing about surfing is it changes your whole perspective of life in general. It's something that's uh, like meditation on the water, and it's spiritual, yet it's very athletic and adventurous at the same time. It encompasses everything, and you can do it solo and meet other people in the water, or you can grow up with your family and, like I did, uh, surfing with my dad and my twin sister and younger sister, and our mom boogie boarded, so it's a family affair as well. And to people visiting California, it's living the dream. So you actually started surfing when you were a young kid because you were kind of raised in a, a family of surfers? Yes. So uh, baby surfers and little surfers are called grommets or groms. And so we were little <laughs> surf groms growing up. The, our dad taught us how to surf. Our first pictures are of us on a surfboard. We were three years old and he'd paddle us around. And then when we were eight, we got our own boards. Yeah. So we, we've kind of grown up in this whole environment. And for us, it was very natural. And it's something we've wanted to share all along. And now you're the co-owner of Surf Diva, which is quite an institution in La Jolla. It's part of, it's, it's kind of part surf school, part surf boutique, right? Yes. So Surf Diva started as the first all women surf school in the world in 1996. And after about six years, we went co-ed. We had a visitor from San Francisco, uh, a French guy who wanted to learn from the divas. And so we thought, why not? We'll let a guy in. And then after that, the floodgates opened. And we have <laughs> since gone completely co-ed. So we still have our women's clinics, but we have half of our instructors are guys or divos, as I like to call them. And we mm -hmm. have 78 surf instructors who work with us. And we teach kids, women, men, corporations, like team building events, all kinds of fun things, bachelorette parties. It's just a dream come true to work here in this environment with my twin sister. Well, it sounds like a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, if it's all right with you, I'd like to focus on surf lessons for a minute. On a personal level, I love hitting the beach and I always spend lots of time in the water, but I've never actually been on a surfboard before. And I think it, you know, it might be overdue. Maybe it's time for me to actually do it. So do you think you could teach me to surf? I think I can teach anyone how to surf. Honestly, <laughs> it's uh, for me, it's about enjoying the ride. We work with people of all different abilities and skill levels. All right. So listen, I'd like to walk through the process step by step. And I have a lot of questions. So first off, how far in advance would I need to book for a private lesson? 
Generally, a couple days in advance is all you need. If you have a set time that you know you're coming, a week or two is great. We get pretty booked up in August and September is one of our best high seasons. Uh, October is beautiful in California as well. The water is warmest in September and October. So definitely book a few days in advance. Okay, perfect. So now I've secured a lesson and I show up in La Jolla. Do I need to bring anything? Just bring a smile. That's all you need. And you can bring a bathing suit. Uh, you have to wear uh, you have to wear one of those, even if you rent a wetsuit. Uh, in the colder months, we rent wetsuits. And you always want to wear your board shorts underneath. And then so do we get right into the water? Do we spend some time on the beach first? How does it work? The first thing you do is you check in at our surf shop where you'll sign a waiver and you get your hand stamped. And then we direct you to the beach and our surf instructors are waiting for you. Our block is our Surf school is two blocks away from La Jolla Shores, one of the most beautiful beaches in California, actually in the world. And Mm. uh, the beach is great because it's very wide, sandy beach. There's no rocks or reef to worry about. Uh, It's what we call a beach break. So you walk down to the edge of the boardwalk and meet our surf instructors that are um, dressed in red rash guards. They're red surf shirts and red hats. And they'll take you to the sand and there's a dry land orientation. Uh, We go over safety and then they get you in the water. So what is the dry land orientation? What is it like? Can you walk me through just briefly like the highlights of it? What do we learn there? Absolutely. So the lesson plan that you get from Surf Diva is very detailed. But the most important thing that we teach people is about safety and Mm -hmm. also about expectations. Our main goal is that whoever's learning from us has fun. And our motto is the best surfer in the water is the one having the most fun. It's not, (laughs) we're not here to grade people or to judge people. We're the non-judgmental surf school. We have highly qualified five-star coaches who will show you whatever level you're at to get to the next level and to enjoy the learning process. So some of the main things we go over, for example, safety, is um, not to dive off your board in the shallow water uh, for obvious reasons. There could be a sandbar underneath and it looks deep, but maybe it's not. We also teach people to keep their board to the side of them when they go out in the water so the wave doesn't push it into your face. So board handling techniques are important. We talk about the currents and how to use the currents to your advantage. Uh, Knowledge is very powerful in the ocean. I'm guessing you also teach people how to stand up when you're there in the sand? We practice on land, so it's called the pop-up, and we show people where to lay down on the board and how to paddle and then how to pop up. We have different methods of teaching people to pop up. Everyone has different body strengths, body sizes, body shapes, so we have different different tricks up our sleeve to help people get up on the board, and they're all fun, whichever one works for you. Now, how big are the waves at La Jolla Shores? The waves here are great. We really are lucky to have this spot because we're blocked by the south swells by La Jolla Cove. So when the waves are huge up the coast, uh, the south swells pass us up. So you have different levels of surfing that we can accommodate. So on the south side of the beach, it'll be one to two foot, which are like the perfect little beginner waves. As you go Mm. a little bit further, it's two to three. And then as you go further up, it's three to five feet up towards Scripps, the northern part of our beach. And if you keep going up to Black's Beach, those waves can be six to eight foot on a south swell, even more. They are world-class waves. So there's something Mm. for everyone of all skill levels. And that's the blessing of it. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, What do you think is the hardest part for most people when they're just beginning to learn? The hardest part is expectations. Uh, Surfing looks really easy. And I'll tell you, it's, it's really one of, um, it's one of the most challenging sports to learn because you're trying to predict what the ocean is going to do. And every wave is different, but that's the beauty of it. uh, Because there's, there's the adventure involved. Okay, what am I going to get today? What are the waves going to feel like? Are they going to be strong? Are they going to be mushy or cotton candy, as I like to call them, the fluffy waves? Mm. And are they going to break fast or slow? Can I do a turn? Or do I have to kick out of the wave? Or is the wave just going to close out and then I'll end up going straight into the beach on on the whitewater part of the wave? So every wave is different, and and that's what makes it really cool. And it keeps you on your toes too, right? (laughs) Absolutely. There's never a boring day in the water, ever. And, uh, you know... I love to surf and paddleboard and stand up um, 
stand up paddle boarding is really fun too. And people like to body surf. You could surf so many different ways on different waves. And even body surfing is making a big uh, comeback, a resurgence right now. Uh, so all levels of surfing work with different types of waves. What would you say is like the highlight of the lesson for most students? So everyone wants what I call the MasterCard moment where they pop up and ride that wave in. Um, <laughs> or the now it's the Instagram moment. Um, right. So everyone wants to catch a wave, ride it in as long as possible. And everyone will always remember your first wave. It's like your first kiss. You'll never forget it. Do any of your students take to surfing instantly? And, and do you kind of know if they're going to continue with the sport afterward? Yes, yeah, some of our students get absolutely addicted and they're hooked. Uh, we've had hmm. students quit their jobs and move here wow. and sell their properties in Chicago or wherever and say, this is my new lifestyle. I don't care about um, owning all these companies or being CEO or, or making tons of money. I just want to be a surfer. That's amazing. I mean, what about like uh, different body types or ages? I mean, who who's coming to to learn how to surf at your shop there? We start kids as young as five years old, as long as they can swim underwater, grab an object from the bottom of the pool and bring it up. If they're comfortable doing that, we can get them in the water surfing and they take to it very quickly. Um, and then our oldest student was actually 88 years old, a World War II veteran who came and learned to surf from us. So that was pretty amazing. And then just yesterday, we had a beautiful 82-year-old lady come in. She's going to be a surf diva now, and she's taking lessons with us repeatedly. She's really stoked, and I think this is going to be a new chapter in her life. So any age of any physical ability, all levels can learn to surf. That is pretty incredible. And you don't have to be in the fittest shape, right? You can kind of be like average fitness level. You can be the most out of shape person. We will teach you how to surf. Wow. Sounds great. I mean, so, all right, so let's continue. Let's assume I finished my, my two hour lesson. It was a success. I stood up, I surfed, and now I want to experience a bit of San Diego surf culture. Can you help me out there too? The food here is excellent. We have a lot of Mexican cuisine. We have Italian and a lot of American burgers that are amazing that will melt in your mouth. And of course, great cocktails. I can tell you all about those, too. <laughs> well, okay, let's talk about specifics. Like, where should I go for lunch, for example? For lunch, I would go to Shore Rider. It's an open-air beach bar. People are in their bathing suits, and they're known for their nachos, their margaritas, and fish tacos. And are there, like, any super-friendly coffee houses or other hangouts I might want to check out while I'm there? There's some great coffee houses here. There's... Brick and Bell were there every day. Their almond lattes with cinnamon on top are to die for. And we always bring our own mugs because you don't need the plastic. Uh, we're very cognizant of that in California. And I'm really proud of that fact that Californians are very environmentally conscious. And then um, the other thing about California in general is the craft beer scene here in California is world-class. And I think we're mm -hmm, taking mm -hmm. over Europe. Sorry, Belgium. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And what about other beaches around San Diego County? I mean, La Jolla has a great reputation. It's a beautiful beach. But if I was in town for, say, a long weekend or longer, where else should I go to check out the scene and, and maybe try out my new surfing skills? Del Mar is a beautiful beach about... 20 minutes north of La Jolla Shores. It's the drive to Del Mar is incredible. There's Torrey Pines State Reserve with the famous Torrey Pines trees that are only found here in the world. They're unique. And when you see them at sunset, silhouetted in front of the, the, the sun in front of the Pacific Ocean, it's just breathtaking. Del Mar has beautiful shops and restaurants as well. There's the famous L'Auberge Hotel. That sounds great. Uh, what about mm -hmm. bonfires on the beach? I've always imagined kind of in my mind that you know, the, ha having a bonfire on the beach at night as kind of the ultimate way to end California surfing day. Do people actually do that? People do that. It's, uh, there's certain, there's only limited fire rings that people can find. And so a lot of people share the fire rings. It's kind of an open, hey, come hang out with us. And that's how you can meet people on the beach and bring a blanket and some s'mores. If you show up with s'mores, they'll let you share their, their fire. So <laughs> yes, I'm bringing gifts. Of course, as always. Well, I mean, this has been epic, Izzy. Thank you so much for all of your insights. 
Thank you. It's great to talk to you. And I hope I get to see you down here at La Jolla Shore soon. We'll get you surfing. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love it. That'd be great. Izzy Tahani and her sister Coco are the owners of Surf Diva, a surf boutique and surf school in La Jolla, where you can rent surfboards, find all sorts of surf fashion and gear, and learn how to actually catch a wave. For links to all of the places we discussed today, visit our website, visitcalifornia.com slash podcast. This is California Now. If you've ever wondered what it's like to enjoy luxurious creature comforts while surrounded by Mother Nature, you'll want to stick around for our third segment today. Ruben Martinez from GlampingHub.com will join us to talk about glamping, what it is, how to experience it, and where to go. He'll even give California Now podcast listeners a coupon code good for $50 off their first glamping trip in the Golden State. That's coming up a little bit later in the show. My next guest has an unusual resume. Ryan Robinson is a professional highliner and adventure athlete who likes to explore the world in his 1985 Chevy van. He owns a world record for slacklining and has appeared on multiple seasons of the NBC TV series American Ninja Warrior. Ryan recently embarked on a Northern California road trip that started in Sacramento and included stops in Redding, Shasta Cascade, Humboldt County, and Marin County. And he's going to share some of his highlights with us. Uh, Welcome to the California Now podcast, Ryan. Thank you so much for having me. So, you know, before we talk about your road trip through Northern California, I'd love to hear more about your slacklining world record. I mean, earlier this year, you walked 1,919 feet on a one-inch line strapped between two bridges in Folsom. That sounds kind of terrifying. What prompted you to do that? I actually started my slacklining endeavors right underneath that bridge. Uh, There's a little kind of bar right off of the river down there. Um, And I started that journey on a line about 20 to 30 feet long, about a foot and a half off the ground. And that was kind of the stomping grounds of of my journey getting into slacklining. And then over the course of the next several years, I was able to uh, continue that journey and going higher and longer and doing crazier and crazier lines. And that prepared me for this next endeavor. Now, how long did it take you to get across? And and, and what was going through your mind when you finally made it to the other side? (laughs) Well, it took me around, I think around 35 minutes. I was actually going pretty quickly. All of the Uh, Other things were on my side, so wind was on my side and weather was on my side. Um, Getting to the point where I actually was ready to walk the line was an interesting experience. (laughs) I (laughs) came out of uh, to to get on the line about 15 minutes before I I actually did and had a little freak out moment. (laughs) So I had to go back (laughs) to the van, take a quick breather. There were about 8,000 people. (laughs) No pressure, right? No pressure. A whole lot, yeah. And then they all started (laughs) cheering and I freaked out, ran back to the van. (laughs) Holy cow, it's actually happening. (laughs) <laughs> but uh, yeah, being out there, the feeling was just totally incredible. The second I stood up, I could just feel that everyone was on my side and rooting for me. And But it was really wild too, because every time they held their breath, I held my breath. And every time mm. I had a little stumble, they had, <gasps> it was very intense. <laughs> well, even just watching the video online of you making that crossing, you know, I was also, I felt like I was there and I had my, my heart was in my throat. I spent some time on your Instagram feed today. Um, there are quite a, f- a few spectacular photos of you doing some amazing things in some really beautiful settings. I mean, highline walking, bungee jumping, stuff like that. What inspires you to explore the world this way? That is a, a really challenging question to answer. <laughs> I started to realize the potential of what we could do with this knowledge of ropes and and the ability of being up high over these cliffs. We just started realizing, hey, we could do this, we could do that, we could rig these ropes that way. And then all of a sudden, yeah, you find yourself in these crazy places and sometimes you look back and don't really, can't really connect the dots about how you got there, but you're there <laughs> and it's awesome. So, hey, let's just enjoy this and continue being as safe as we can. All right. Well, let's talk about your recent Northern California road trip. I believe you started out in your home turf, Sacramento, and then went north to Redding and the Shasta Cascade region. What was your overall goal on this trek? Yeah, I just wanted to get out there and um, just explore those those corners and the quiet places that I don't often get to go. So seeing really special waterfalls that were just tucked back into the middle of nothing and um, getting to yeah spend time in the Shasta area and and wake up and see Shasta just right there in the background, just creating this 
incredible backdrop. So that was really my intention going into it is to actually not go uh, the route of, of finding the most extreme things, but just getting to explore those little adventures that really feed your soul. That's what I was looking for. Mm. Can you tell us about some of those hidden gems that drew you to the Shasta Cascade? We actually found these gorgeous waterfalls. Um, well, and of course I said I wasn't, I, my intention wasn't to do anything too extreme, but then we saw this waterfall and there was a perfect uh, diving board off of it. So of course, you know, we had to backflip <laughs> it. Couldn't help Why yourself. <laughs> right. Really couldn't. It's just, it's, it was just too perfect. It was just calling our names and we had to do it. So it turned into a perfect moment, a great morning, get, uh, get some cold water in our system. So that was fun. And, and what else? Uh, tell us a little bit more about your time in, in Shasta Cascade and Reading. Yeah. Well, these, these trips are funny. You know, you go into it with this intention of seeing like 25 things and then we get so hyper-focused on a few of the things <laughs> that all of a sudden you're behind schedule. So, um, yeah, we, we really try to, you know, get all the meat off the bone and that's what we ended up doing. So we actually saw a few less things, but we were able to really, yeah, suck the marrow out of all of it. And we actually had a really cool experience uh, at Castle Crags. Uh, Castle Crags is like this big, like, rock formation, right? Can, kind of, kind mm. of, can you paint a picture for people who've never seen it? Sure, yeah. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty amazing because if you're driving on the freeway and you're not paying attention, you can totally pass it. But if you just look a hair to the right, you see one of the most incredible... Uh, rock features up there and it literally looks like a castle up on the hill it's these gorgeous mm -hmm. spires that are just shooting right out and I, you actually get a beautiful view uh, of Shasta from there as well so what happened at Castle Crags so it was pretty pretty cool so we got up to the top and upon uh, arriving there we started talking to people and this this group of kids pulled up just totally excited out of their minds and so we got to talking to them and it turns out they were going to go rappel down this section of waterfalls and so, of course, I'm like, guys, is it cool if I, like, join you? Are you kidding? You, you have to join us. That would be so sick. I'm Joining sensing a them. pattern here with you. Yeah, it, it tends to, yeah, the stoke tends to breed stoke. And, yeah, you kind of end up, the world ends up putting people in, in, your, in your path that, that make all the adventures happen. So we got all our stuff ready, got all our harnesses, ropes, and everything, and started heading up. Uh, ended up getting to the top of this uh, this gorgeous vista and it was it was pretty beautiful because we had weather coming in on the far side so looking out from uh the, the waterfall section and then we were able to actually take all those waterfalls down so section by section so we had five or six different rope sections and every one of them was just a new adventure a different type of waterfall there were a couple where we were actually able to jump off and rappel down into these beautiful pools it was just mm. it was so cool Wow, it's amazing. Just to be, be able to just stumble on something like that and then just have this totally amazing adventure that you didn't even plan on having. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and a lot of times I, I actually, I don't plan for that reason, which sounds counterintuitive, but I swear every time I go out and do this type of stuff, we end up just bumping into way cooler adventures than we could have planned. So it was just perfect. You know, Mount Shasta itself is an amazing sight to behold just from the road What's it like to actually be on the mountain? Yeah, it's it's a really unique mountain because you can see pretty much the whole uh, path to the summit uh, from the road, but then you get on it and it's way more magnificent than you ever could have thought from the road. You get all these different vistas and you get all these cool little gems along the way where you'll be hiking for hours and then you'll finally remind yourself to turn around. And when you turn around and look out into the vista, you get just <laughs> the most gorgeous views of, of the valley below. So, you know, after tooling around in the Shasta Cascade region, you traveled west to Humboldt County, right? So tell us a little bit about that drive. Yeah, so the drive from, uh, from Shasta area to Humboldt really is spectacular because you're going from this... Uh, sort of one type of forest environment to a whole different type of forest environment. Uh, you're going from pines and then all of a sudden you're getting into the redwoods with their beautiful canopies and everything. So uh, after a couple hours, we finally uh, arrived down in Arcata and that's kind of the access point for a lot of the adventures that we're able to uh, get into down uh, on the coast, including getting it down into the, the Lost Coast. And, and, and they call that stretch of coast the Lost Coast because there aren't any, like, big roadways kind of 
heading t- toward it. So did, did you actually make it to the Lost Coast? <laughs> we did, yeah. So we're going down uh, through the Redwoods. We find this trail section, and we had heard a rumor that there was a trail section that headed down into the, the Lost Coast. So we just decided to sort of go for it. And uh, getting on that trail, hiked for half hour, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Uh, little by little, we started noticing that the environment was changing. We started going downhill. Um, and then all of a sudden, the sunset light started pushing through those trees. And sort of all these little things started happening where it was kind of a bite of what we knew was coming, which was this <laughs> this beautiful sunset on the coast. And we were just kind of hoping that we could get there in time, chasing the sunset, as we often find ourselves sort of chasing the sunset. <laughs> and uh, eventually, going through these different environments, we found ourselves... Uh, taking off our shoes and running in the sand uh, on the Lost Coast and one of the coolest experiences I've ever had. So, you know, it sounds like you you went from, you know, this quiet redwood grove that was like super silent to the coastline where you're, you know, you're hearing the crashing waves coming down. How did it feel to go from like one extreme to the other? It was a really special experience, actually. Uh, Being in the redwoods is so cool because you're you, you just feel this solitude and you get to hear all of these quiet sounds uh, because of the canopy just being sort of holding everything in. And so mm. walking along those trails, you have this peace. And and as you sort of find that trail, it's almost like slowly uh, bringing the music in in a song. <laughs> so the closer we got to the coastline, you started hearing just this very quiet sort of noise of the ocean and the closer we got, then you finally started hearing the crashing. And what a cool thing it was to kind of be led to the water through that, that experience of sound. It's just such a cool treat. Uh, and it accompanies all of the things that we were experiencing in the moment uh, other than that. So the sun setting and we had the sounds and the feeling of the sand on our feet, all of the senses were peaking. It was just such a cool thing. Wow, it sounds truly amazing. It was it was spectacular. It always is. Every time I go to the California coast, it's just very wow. very spectacular. And 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 throughout this whole trip, you were basically living the van life, right? I mean, like hashtag van life. <laughs> very much so. Yeah, yeah. It's it's been something I've been going on for about four years now. Yeah, but tell me, like, what is it about traveling this way that you find so appealing? <sighs> it's just so freeing. It's so liberating. I feel claustrophobic if I stay in one place for too long, which of course, every now and then it concerns me a little bit. I try I think to myself, what's the rest of my life going to look like? Is this ever going to change? <laughs> I'm sure it will, you know, if when my life changes, or, you know, if a family comes into, into the picture or something like that. But even then, I really don't know that I have an intention of stopping the adventure. Right. Maybe the van will get a bit bigger. <laughs> <laughs> you need a bigger van. So your last stop was down in Marin County, right? What was that leg of the journey like? Yeah, after the Redwoods and the Lost Coast, we we had a couple of options. We could either go inland or we could stay on the coast. And while we were thinking about this, I sort of just had this little blip in my mind. And I was reminded of Mount Tam and how badly I had wanted to go see a sunset there. I had seen a couple of pictures and a lot of my friends had been there. And all I've ever heard is how special these sunsets are. And how unique they are because you have these rolling hills and they're layered and layered and layered all the way into the distance. Uh, so I kind of looked at my friends and like, hey guys, we could go inland or we could go to Mount Tam. I don't know if you guys have seen it. I don't know if you've heard the rumors, but this place is, it's it's just, it's going to blow your mind. It's beyond anything. Like the pictures can't do it justice. I think we should go there. Mm. I, I, I love it. I love it. So, you know, it sounds like you had really quite an adventure and our time is almost up here. But I'm wondering, Ryan, what do you make of California's diverse offerings as a travel destination? Oh, I can I can very confidently say I've I've been all over the world. And to this day, California is one of my favorite places to continue to explore. Even though I've been around it dozens of times, I still continue to find new gems that I never would have imagined existed. All right. Very cool. Thanks so much for joining us today, Ryan. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. 
Have you ever dreamt about a luxurious vacation in a California treehouse or getting away from it all in a high-end teepee or yurt? Well, my next guest is here to help. Ruben Martinez is co-founder of GlampingHub.com, a site that makes it easy to find unique, comfortable accommodations throughout California and all over the world. Welcome to the California Now podcast, Ruben. Thanks for having me. So, you know, today we're going to talk about glamping. I know it's it's a mashup of the words glamorous and camping, right? But aside from that, I'm not entirely sure what it actually means. How do you define glamping? Yeah, so, I mean, our, our guests are typically looking for three specific items. One is going to be a direct access to Mother Nature. Um, the second is a, a certain level of comfort. And third is a, a uniqueness. So um, on our site specifically, we've got several types of accommodations like tree houses and safari tents and bell tents and yurts and um, huts and beach casitas. Mm-hmm. But really what it is, is is an opportunity to experience mother nature, but uh, be comfortable. And the way that I always explain it is that, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with camping. I love traditional camping uh, as well. But what glamping is, is, is everything that you really like about uh, camping and every and and nothing uh, you know the things that you don't actually like about uh, camping. So it's it's best of both worlds. Um, right, so it's right. ability to be comfortable but uh, experience Mother Nature. That sounds really cool and very exotic. I mean, we're, so we're not exactly talking about roughing it. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a little bit of everything. So there's definitely some properties where you know they're, they're they can be pricey, but you have um, you know those high end. Uh, uh, luxury amenities like I, like the chef and the uh, um, helicopter rides and things like that, or um, uh, things at the low end where it's uh, seventy five dollars a night and you can get that direct access to Mother Nature, but you're not you know you're not spending uh, your your children's college funds on it. Well, let's talk about the expense. Um, you know, when I think of glamping, I think of it you know maybe being more on the pricey side. But let's talk about the range that that someone mm-hmm. can experience glamping at. We do have accommodations that are forty dollars a night, all the way up to uh, you could really spend forty thousand dollars a night if you wanted to, um, and then everything in between. And so, uh, for anybody who's looking on our website, I think one thing that does surprise them is the amount of options that are in their area. So they could go to uh, a teepee uh, for the weekend. They can go to a safari tent the next weekend, a tree house the weekend after that. And not really have to travel more than a few hundred miles to to get there. It's all within driving distance, um, and so there are different levels uh, of luxury, different levels of of experience. I, I think that's one of the things that I really love about glamping itself is that it's not just about the accommodation. Uh, that is a very important piece to it, but you can go to um, you know a safari tent outside of San Francisco and do wine tasting or um, uh, hiking or fishing or there's countless. Uh, experiences and, and activities that are attached either to the property or within the surrounding area. And so it allows you to define the level of luxury um, that you want to uh, search for. Well, yeah, I was going to ask you about that because when I think of glamping, I'm, I think I really associate it with you know those experiences. So it's not so much about necessarily going to a remote place and taking it easy. It's really about going to remote places and doing interesting things, right? The California glamping uh, industry has really taken on a level of, of innovation and entrepreneurship uh, as well. And so uh, we always hear of these different and, and unique camps that keep uh, or accommodations that keep uh, popping up and, and everything from, you know, fly fishing, uh, river rafting, um, you know, uh, there's different farm to table, um, horseback riding. Um, and, and so the accommodation itself is important because uh, we do have quite a few people who are living, who are leaving the uh, busy c- city and, and trying to, uh, you know, disconnect to, to reconnect, uh, if you will. Um, and, and they do want to experience this very unique structure, but they also want to experience a very unique um, experience. And a majority of these accommodations will have that uh, there with it. Right. I mean, I would imagine also like things like wine tasting or, or kayaking or bird watching would be something that you could easily do while you're glamping in California. Absolutely. There's, there was, uh, there's three in particular off the top of my head that are in the uh, uh, Sonoma Valley, and, and they, uh, you actually get to stay um, on the vineyard. And so you're, I think you're in a, you are in a, a yurt, and one's a safari tent. And basically, you get to do wine tasting and then uh, retire back to your uh, glamping accommodations. So I think that one's extremely popular for for that reason. You know, why leave the uh, why leave the vineyard? 
<laughs> exactly. Uh, who are today's glampers? Are they are they millennials? Are families glamping? International travelers? Are are you a glamping guy? Uh, y- yes, I am. Um, <laughs> uh, I, before kids, I don't know if I was much of a glamper, but definitely uh, I've got two uh, young daughters, and uh, glamping is is the way to go. It's just it's a lot more comfortable. Do, do you get a sense that glamping is a growing category of travel? Yeah, it is. And, and this is something that we've seen over the last uh, 10 years, but we know for certain it is for a few different reasons. One, um, I mean, there's hundreds and thousands of these uh, properties all over the world. Um, California is uh, our number one market within our number one market within the United States. And so there's new uh, properties and businesses that are popping up every single day. So there's no, uh, there's no sense that it's slowing down. Um, we get about 60,000 visits every single month within the California uh, area and um, and seven hundred thousand worldwide, and on top of that, in in the last few uh, months, uh, we'll call it the last eight months or so, there's been significant outside investment into the business of glamping, and so something that we hadn't really seen five years ago. So, the appetite to invest in these outdoor unique accommodations and experiences is is here and it's palpable and, and um, there's no sense of it it's slowing down. And, and, you know, what I typically tell people is is if they don't understand it or if they, they can't quite understand the growth, once they go the first time, typically everybody says, ah, yeah, I get it. You know, this makes yeah. sense. This clicks. I understand everything that it is. And sometimes it's difficult to understand just looking at a a picture or hearing somebody else tell a story. But, uh, you know, as soon as you you stay your first night in a safari tent and you've got that, you know, um, uh, undisrupted view and you've just went on a hike and you don't have to sleep on the floor or drink or uh, eat burnt hot dogs, you know, everybody, it seems <laughs> to click with everybody. Well, you know, before speaking with you, I visited your site, glampinghub.com, and I clicked my way over to the California section and I saw that you have more than 2,300 glamping listings in the Golden State alone. I mean, that's a lot. Uh, I'd love for you to talk about some of the most popular and most unusual glamping experiences here. Uh, what's a best seller for you? Um, one of our best uh, sellers is this tree house in Santa Cruz. Um, it books out, I believe, two years in advance. Wow. <laughs> the reason why it's so popular is because of how secluded it is. Um, it's, not a, it's not a terribly big tree house, so you can't bring a, bring a, a huge group there. But it's great for a small family. Uh, for a couple. And uh, it's one of those that just looks hidden and, and it almost surprises you uh, when you when you first see it. Um, and being able to be up there um, in the trees and be able to experience it, it, it's a mixture of taking you back to almost like a childhood memory. And it's this, ex, um, uh, it's ex, this experience of being able to just do something completely different and, and unique. And so your senses are all uh, turned on and you're trying to figure out, you know, it's this mixture of excitement, but relaxation. Mm-hmm. Um, and the inside is, is very well done, um, very well decorated. Um, the other one is going to be out of um, Warner Springs outside of San Diego. Um, and that one books out far in advance as well. And it's a safari mm-hmm. tent with a hot tub inside of it with um, this beautiful deck and these rolling hills. And you open the flap of the safari tent and you can see uh, you know, for miles and miles and miles of, of, you know, beautiful terrain. And it's pretty simple, but at the same time, uh, luxurious because you have everything that you could need. And it really promotes this, this level of, you know, I'm going to hang out here and drink my glass of wine and look at the scenery and, and nothing else could bother me in the world. And so I think that's an important part of um, these types of accommodations within California is that if you go from uh, Northern California, to Southern California, you do have a lot of options, but they're all different. That, that safari tent in San Diego is completely different from the one in, from the treehouse in, in Santa Cruz. And so the level of variety is beautiful. Right. And w- when you call it a safari tent, what makes it different from like a regular tent? Uh, the safari tents in California are uh, decent size. They typically have a restroom with a shower in them. They could have um, enough for at least one king size bed and, and maybe a, a sitting area. They're usually elevated onto a deck or some type of wooded uh, platform. Um, some are insulated as well. Um, there's some great technology out there where uh, there's winter safari tents as well. So people can clamp year round. Um, you're not going to get cold. They have wood burning stoves in there. Um, and so you can stand up. They're typically at least uh, you know 10 feet high. Uh, so you don't feel cramped. Um, you don't feel like you don't have enough space. You could 
you could really just be in the tent all day if you wanted to. Um, but the beautiful part is that you have everything that you, you need in regards to comfort, but they're able to put these types of accommodations in such remote areas that a traditional you know, brick and mortar building just wouldn't be able to um, exist there. It, it's, it's just impossible. Right. Okay. So we have a, uh, an amazing tree house. We have a safari tent in an amazing location. How about one more? Yeah. Um, outside of Malibu, you're going to see a lot of airstreams as well. Um, so uh, there's there's a few encampments that have quite a few airstreams. And those are great because they're typically located right next to the beach. So you can go out and, and experience uh, you know, the beach, do some surfing, walk on the beach, go read. And then you get to retire back to your um, your airstream, and which are very popular as well. I think um, specifically within California more than any other state, those are extremely popular, sometimes hard to, to get into just because of how popular they are. But um, there's a few more um, airstream businesses that are uh, popping up in, in California. So if people wanted to, to go um, this year, they shouldn't have any issues. And those are all season two. So you can go, whether you're going in August or going in December, um, you should be able to experience those. And, and what is like the cost level for the three examples you just gave us right now? What kind of range are we in? Yeah, range from one twenty-five to three hundred dollars a night for those top sellers. I um, mean, really, they're reasonably priced. You can easily find um, something starting at a thousand dollars, but uh, some of the top sellers are are reasonably priced and and great hosts too. I mean, um, these glamping accommodations and 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 the host of these properties. Um, this is personal for them. This is either a retirement plan for them, something that they have thought about for the last 15 years. Maybe they came across a glamping style accommodation on their own travels and said, man, this is this is what I want to do. I want to start one of these accommodations. So they really put their their love and their energy and their passion into these properties. And so that that is seen in the experience and the little details um, of the accommodations. Are, are there any truly bizarre places listed on your site? There are actually. I mean, um, the one off the top of my head is a, uh, a jet that is a treehouse private jet. So it's a retired airplane. And they somehow, some way lifted it up into um, these ginormous trees that overlook a beach. And um, it's a, I believe, a three or four bedroom that they're able to fit into this uh, jet. And yeah, it's, it's this red private jet treehouse. And um, you know that one's that one's pretty popular. They've done a good job of redoing the inside. I believe you know the cockpit is is one bedroom, so it's not the <laughs> biggest. It's not the biggest of accommodations um, this world has ever seen. But you look at it and and it obviously causes you pause because you're thinking, wow, what is there a is there a plane stuck in the tree? But um, right, right, that's funny. Yeah, there's another one that's this treehouse as well. That is a um, um, a p- picture of a big box that's uh, in a tree, and each side, each wall is actually um, mirrors. So on the outside, it it causes a reflection um, off of the trees, and so it looks invisible. It looks like you can't oh. even see it because it's causing a reflection from the surrounding. Right. It's like camouflage. And that's funny. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so people are doing some really creative. Uh, thing. And, and that's the beautiful part about this is that when you have the land, you're able to think of something that's creative that fits these individuals' personality and the individual um, surrounding and nature. And and really, it's it's there's no limits on the type of creativity um, that these accommodations can have. Are there any California regions that are particularly popular for glamping? Maybe the deserts or Lake Tahoe. Yeah, Lake Tahoe is is one of our. Um, uh, Heavy traffic uh, areas uh, for the obvious reason that it's, you know it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful area. But you have the different resorts that are uh, around there, and, and all sorts of unique types of uh, accommodations. So between you know Truckee, Lake Tahoe, Big Bear, um, uh, Big Bear Lake, you know those areas are extremely uh, popular. Uh, Sonoma, uh, popular. There's um, quite a few right outside, about um, 45 minutes outside of San Francisco. As well, Joshua Tree. Um, there's some beautiful accommodations in Joshua Tree. Yeah, this is really all great stuff. Uh, but before you go, I'm thinking there are probably a few listeners out there who are intrigued by the idea of glamping, but they might be a little intimidated by something so new to them. So, what would be a good entry level glamping experience? That's a good question. I think the uh, 
I think you're right in that maybe the, uh, the, 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 the private jet tree house might be a little intimidating for most people if this <laughs> is their first time getting into it and it might seem like too much the first go around. <laughs> so my recommendation would be uh, just try out one of the rustic cabins um, within California. There's quite a few options. And what's great about them is that uh, it's a high level of comfort. You have full electricity, obviously, and running water and, and restrooms and multiple bedrooms, and, and they typically have that experience or activity that's attached. And so it, it, it's, it doesn't stray too far from um, what, what they're used to, um, but typically has them embedded somewhere in Mother Nature. And so it's, that's typically a, a, a good way to start, especially if people aren't interested in maybe trying out some of the more um, unique and out there ideas of, of glamping. And I'm willing to bet your site, glampinghub.com, is ready to accommodate first-timers as well as seasoned veterans, right? We'll do our best to try and make it as accessible for the first-time users out there. Um, Any first-time user can go to our website and uh, use the code CANOW, and they'll get $50 off of any booking within uh, California. And so um, that'll be good for um, any user to use, and, and I think a great way to uh, experience and segue and an excuse uh, to to go try glamping in California for the first time. Wow, that's really great. What a, what a wonderful uh, and generous gift and incentive for people to, to try glamping out. And, you know, you've given me a better sense of what glamping is all about as well. And I'm sure our listeners feel the same way. Thank you so much for joining us here on California Now. My pleasure. Ruben Martinez is the co-founder of GlampingHub.com, a great resource for anybody thinking about exploring nature in a unique and decidedly comfortable way. For links to all of the places we discussed today, be sure to visit our website, visitcalifornia.com slash podcast. This is California Now. Thank you for listening to California Now. This podcast is produced by Visit California, I'm your host, Satirius Johnson. You can find us on iTunes and Stitcher. Please subscribe. And you can learn more about the Golden State and plan your next visit at visitcalifornia.com slash podcast. We'll provide links to all of the people and places you learn about here on the show. That's visitcalifornia.com slash podcast. Ruben Martinez generously offered podcast listeners $50 off on their first booking at glampinghub.com. Enter code CANOW at checkout. Offer is good until October 31st, 2019. And I've got another sweet deal for you. We want to send you a free copy of the California Visitor's Guide. This 200-page magazine is loaded with inspirational trip ideas, beautiful photography, and insider tips on places to go and things to do. And yes, it's totally free. Go to visitcalifornia.com slash CVG to order your copy. 